a lot of the basics aren't really being addressed. They're not, so we have so much churn in our field that if you go to conferences, a lot of the content in a conference is, churn, is aimed at, targeted at the new people that are coming in because that's the largest you know, body count wise uh, that you have at a conference. Not always true, but, but that's the perception. So one of the things that the old guard used to say at NSPI and ISPI is that there's nothing for us here at this conference. It's all geared to beginner level, intermediate level, but there's nothing for the advanced level. And then you put on something that's, you know, advanced and everybody that's <laughs> beginners and intermediates go to the advanced stuff because that's where, you know, they think that's that's how I can accelerate my my trajectory here through the, you know, my career. And and so we also have then marketing people. Uh, my saying is, well, I know what's old is new again. Everybody is taking old things repackaging them slightly, changing the language in the, of the labels and the imagery that is how it's presented and presenting old stuff as if it's, you know, brand spanking new, new and improved. And that's not necessarily true. And so people coming up the learning curve and the performance curves in our field have to contend with the fact that some people call it the, others call it the, and I'm not quite sure it's the same thing. And it's this or that, which looks like, you know, it's really the same thing, but they're calling it this and these other people are calling it that. And is that is that different or not? And so because we don't have a common vocabulary, and this was a complaint in 1979 when I entered, so it ain't going away ever. So you're everybody has to contend with the fact that that's just the real world. I, but if you deal with your customers internal, you're going to find that they talk different languages on the East Coast and the West Coast than in the South. And so, or in this part of the building and that part of the building. And so we're all, as part of our, uh, a test uh, for us is to demystify all of that noise and distill it into its essentials. And that just takes time in, a, in an enterprise, in an industry to figure out the industry lingo and what and what the lingo is in our company because we may not be consistent with the industry for whatever reasons well we got something proprietary we're going to call it something slightly different you know because we're going to brand it and market that way and that just all that causes confusion and so one of the key things i think that makes people successful is their ambiguity tolerance the fact that they can walk into these situations that are very confusing and they can give themselves uh have the patience to figure it out and be bold enough or brave enough to say by when you say the word this do you mean what they're saying when they say that and it is or it isn't you know and and try to not and never ever ever talk in the jargon of our business that you learned at the conference talk in the language of your customers um, because nobody wants to learn our lingo and we should work really hard to learn theirs and to use their labels because we might call it analysis or discovery. And our engineering organization that works with our customers calls it something else. We should adopt and adapt ourselves to their language, the language of our business or our industry, so that people can go, oh, I know what you mean by that. Yeah, of course you'd want to do what you were calling analysis just a little while ago. And I hate that because it's analysis paralysis, but we call this up front here customer requirements. And so if you're going after customer requirements, guy, that's okay. That's a good thing. But this analysis stuff or this discovery stuff, oh, put a hex on that because you know we don't think we like that. So, but that's our challenge. That's what we're always going to be faced with. Um, and so we just have to help new people coming up the curve, the curves of performance and mm -hmm. of knowledge and skills, the learning that they've got to do in order to perform. We need to make sure that those curves mirror each other and in fact collapse and they're really one in the same curve. We're trying to learn things so that we can perform in our context and and that's you know that's the the secret i think that that leaders in l d they need to be putting in the philosophies the processes and the practices 
to help their people be successful. You can't run your L&D shop as an artist colony where everybody's going off doing their own thing their own way. You need to run it more like an engineering department where there are rigid but flexible processes to help people be successful. So the complaints back in this in 79 and in the early 80s was about the same thing here. We have the Peter principle, you know, everybody rises to the level of their incompetent till they're incompetent. Um, and man managers in training and development functions before they became learning and development functions um, didn't know these things either. You know, there were very few educational programs in instructional systems technology, you know, and, and everybody today goes, technology, well, that's digital and computer stuff, cool. Well, no, technology means the application of science and it had nothing to do with computers until it all got meshed together. And now a lot of people, the old guard goes, okay, it's about digital tools. No, it's not. It's about the application of science. What do we know about, you know, so the whole science of learning thing is not new either. These guys were talking about this stuff in the sixties and the seventies. And it's all of a sudden like, you know, it's what's old is new again. It's got a different label on it. Performance engineering, learning engineering, these are things that Gilbert and Rumler talked about in the 60s and 70s. And so this is this is not new, but 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 new people are coming in and it's a constant um new discoveries, rediscoveries. Did Columbus discover America? No, people were already here. You know, but so we got that same kind of silly, stupid mindset that that. And, and and so it's not that it's important that everybody needs to learn from the, you know, the old guys that are no longer with us and, and what they said and how they said it. Um, what's really, and and, so, and what they called it, because we call it something new and, and hipper to much to today, you know, it's, it's just current. And what was important about what was known back then is really, and this is what's lost in some of the new stuff, when does that work and when doesn't it? Under what conditions does that really work? And under what conditions won't that work? And you shouldn't even try to go there with it. That's what's lost when we call things new and improved and brand new. And we don't drag along. Well, this is where that came from. And we don't need to go into long histories of those things. But we can shortcut it to it's under these conditions where that will work. If you don't have all those conditions, go build the conditions to make that work or find a different thing because it ain't going to work under those sets of current conditions. And so that's what's, you know, when does learning work? Well, when the learner is going to learn something well that was designed well to be efficient and effective and goes out to a receiving system, the workplace, where it's going to be anticipated, expected, reinforced for doing these things a new way. Well, how do you make that happen? You may have to train guys, peers, and his boss, and maybe even the suppliers and customers on both sides of the equation, and give everybody to understand that there's a new way to do things. There's a new sheriff in town, and that's what we're trying to implement. What's in it for everybody? Who takes the hit? Because not everybody wins when we make changes. So this department is going to lose big time, and they're going to have to step up to that and gear and resource for that. It's going to take them more time and effort for them to do this. But in total, we win because we reduce quality. We've improved quality, quantity, and reduced costs. But except in that function there, they took the hit. Their costs are going to double. Did we anticipate that? Has the rest of the world realigned itself to that? Or are they going to get beat up by their management chain because their costs are out of control? So performance is complex. It's not a simple thing. And the more we are engaged with the stakeholders, the more that they can point us in the right direction, defend our actions, rationalize our actions to the other group. Hey, you're going to have to double your budget here. Yeah, and we're going to go to bat for you and with the big guys to make sure you get the doubled budget because otherwise your lack of resources is going to screw up our process here and we can't all win if you don't get what you need. And so systems thinking <laughs> is key to this. But God didn't make many people who can bat from the right side of the plate and the left side of the plate and be switch hitters. So we need to collaborate, cooperate with other people to build somebody and have a team that can bat from the left or the right, depending on who's at the at the pitching mound. And so we need to really 
understand things in as a, in a systems framework and understand the people we're trying to train come from what Deming called the system. And we need to make sure that the system has everything in place, not perfectly maybe, but adequate to the needs of the process to produce products and services that meet the stakeholder requirements, the downstream customers and all the other stakeholders too. Because you can meet the needs of the downstream customer you can meet the regulatory requirements, you can meet the union requirements, but you can bankrupt the shareholders because you're having to sell at below cost and that ain't no good. And you know, I think if Rumler were alive, he'd say, because you weren't focused on performance, you couldn't measurably demonstrate that you impacted performance. And so therefore you're maybe seen as a motherhood apple pie issue here and you're not really seen as a contributor. But when you're truly focused on process performance, like the quality people are focused on process performance, and you are using measurements on the front end and the back end to show your differences, and when you've got the transfer happening and you got the impact, but the whole system, the rest of it, is not in, in alignment, then you may not get the ultimate enterprise results you want. So you've got to really ca you know, cast your net wider engage more people in this to, to to help yourself be successful so this but being you know the sacrificial lambs at budget cutting time when it's necessary for the organization to survive if you're not seen as being a va value add if you're just a an expense without uh generating value well beyond your expense then you are subject to being some of the first to go when budgets need to get tight. Um, it's nothing personal. It's just business. And if we don't have a business mindset to focus on the business that we're in and the products and services we render will forever be the first ones that get cut. You know, there are other departments and functions and aspects that get cut as well, but, but training and learning has always been that because way too often, most of the time, we don't really prove our value because we're not focused on those terminal results of the business and seeing them in terms of how they align with our project efforts.